2018 saw gold regain momentum. At the end of the year, gold equities rebounded after lagging behind for some time. And at the same time, U.S. corporate stock buybacks had a record year, but it wasn't so great for the broader markets. Jim Rickards, author of The Road to Ruin, Death of Money, as well as Currency Wars, joins me at the NASDAQ market site. Now, Jim does hold many titles, and he is also an advisor on international economics and financial threats. Jim, great to have you here today. Great to be with you, Remy. Well, here we are at the end of the year. We saw gold inch higher, but we didn't get the strong rebound that many may have expected given the volatility in the broader market. Right. Now, I think recently you referred to the precious metal as the little engine that could. Right. So what's in store for this metal going forward? Well, uh, look, it's, it's definitely going to go up. It's been going up for a long time. But when, when gold goes up in dollars, I don't think that anything happened to gold. You know, you take an ounce of gold, put it in a drawer, close the drawer, come back a year later, open it, it's still an ounce of gold. It didn't you know, turn it into an ounce and a half. There's no dividend, there's no yield, it's money. You know, if you have a $100 bill and you put it in a drawer and come back a year later, it's still a $100 bill. Money doesn't have a yield because there's no risk involved. The reason you get a yield on a bank account, which is very risky, uh, uh, you know, um, stocks, bonds, whatever, is because you're taking some risk and that's why you, you get paid a yield. So uh, gold will go up, but what it really means is the dollar's going down takes more dollars to buy an ounce of gold. So I think of that as a, a devaluation of the dollar rather than gold going up. But that said, most people think of it as dollars per ounce, you know, sure. so it'll, it'll go higher. But uh, when, when I talk to people, they say, uh, hey, Jim, how come gold's not going up, you know, a lot more? Uh, and I say, well, it's amazing it's not going down because you look at the headwinds gold is facing. What, what causes gold to go down? Strong dollar, higher nominal interest rates, higher real interest rates. Mm -hmm. Well, all those things are happening. The dollar is very strong interest rates are going up and real rates are going up faster because inflation is below the, the rate of uh, uh, rate increases. Mm -hmm. uh, all those things are headwinds. Gold should be going down, but it's not. It's going up. And that's where I came up with that uh, metaphor, the little engine that could. It's not going up $100 an ounce a day as it will in, a, in an extreme panic or a new global financial crisis. But, you know, a couple bucks here, a couple bucks there, but it's been working its way up from uh, 1185 not that long ago, a few about six months ago to 1250 uh, approximately today. Well, again, that's a, that's a decent run, but it, but, it, but it hasn't gone up $25 a day. It's, you know, two bucks here, five bucks there. So it's, it's chugging its way higher. I expect that to continue. This is against headwinds. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens when the headwinds turn to tailwinds? When the Fed does pause, I, I don't, you know, it's a little early to forecast March right now. Based on what I know, I would say that the Fed would raise rates in March, but I'll watch that space. There could be reasons why I might say they'll pause as we get a little bit closer to March. But imagine if they did pause. That will give gold a pop because that's the Fed throwing in the towel. That's the Fed saying, hey, we, we were on our way to three and, you know, three and three quarters percent, four percent. That's where we want to get. By the way, the reason for that has nothing to do with all the things that Wall Street talks about. It has to do with getting ready for the next recession. Mm -hmm. they, it takes four percentage points of rate cuts to get the economy out of a recession. So how are you going to cut rates for if you're at two and a half? You can't. Not with the negative rates don't work. We already know that. So they've got to get up to four so they could cut back to zero if need be to get out of a recession. Well, they didn't get there. They're only, like I say, at, at, at two and a half uh, to two and three quarters right now. Um, but if they can't continue that path to get to four percent and normalize the balance sheet, uh, then then they have no you know, dry powder, if you will, for the next recession. But that's a signal that they can't get it. And then that means that they got to work harder on inflation. That's very good for gold. Well, you brought up the R word, Jim. So I have to ask you about your expectations for the next recession. Now, we know that there are bull markets, there are bear markets. And given everything we've seen this year and the risks out there, as well as opportunities, what do you expect to see in terms of timing? Well, uh, we're in something that's worse than a recession. Uh, and we've been in it since 2007, which is a depression. And people say, well, hold on, you know, recession is two consecutive quarters of declining growth and rising unemployment, a couple of other, you know, factors in there. But the basic definition is two consecutive declining quarters of growth. Um, and so people say, well, depression sounds worse than a recession. So if recession is two quarters, a depression must be 10 quarters or something like that, which we don't have. We've been growing for uh, nine years. Uh, but that's not the definition of a depression. A depression, you can grow during a, a depression, but you don't grow a trend. If trend is three and a quarter, three and a half, let's just say three and a quarter, 
and you're growing at two and a quarter, which we have for the last nine years, that gap, that 1% gap between trend growth and actual growth, that's depressed growth. And the gap is a wedge as you know, this you know, growth goes here and uh, trend is here, that wedge gets bigger. We've left over $5 trillion on the table. And if the economy had grown at trend since 2009, mm -hmm. the country would be $5 trillion richer than it is today. So that uh, below trend growth is depressed growth. And that's the definition of a depression, a sustained period of below trend growth with no tendency either to get back to trend or to fall apart completely. By the way, that's John Maynard Keynes' definition. I happen to think it's a good one. But the point being, I, I, I'm much more concerned about the depression, which is now uh, 10 years old, over 10 years old. You know, people in the 90s, they talked about Japan's lost decade. Yes. Well, they've now had three lost decades, and the U.S. has had one. We're heading into two. So if you want to understand the U.S. economy, we're, 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 we're Japan. We're getting like Japan. Now, as far as the technical recession is concerned, we're, we're closer than we want to be. I mean, the Fed, the Fed has never predicted a recession. We've had, I don't know, uh, we've had, uh, you know, 20 since uh, the end of World War II, but the Fed goes back to uh, 1913. They've never predicted a recession. They're not going to predict it this time. They don't see it coming. But, uh, but we're, we're extremely close to it. And this is where you've got this finesse where the Fed wants to raise rates, mm -hmm. not because they're not worried about a recession, but because they want dry powder for the, for the next recession. The question is, in the course of preparing for the next recession, do they cause the recession they're preparing to cure? Mm -hmm. That's the problem. And they might, they might do that. Uh, and the early warning signs are the ones we're seeing, which are stock market going down, yield curve flattening, getting close to inverting, uh, lower commodity prices, um, slower job growth, uh, these are all early warnings of recession. Mm -hmm. And Jim, it's very interesting you mentioned all those points. Uh, when we look at the precious metals markets, uh, we'll keep an eye on the dollar as well as other assets with uh, yield. But this year, there's been a lot of comparison of gold to uh, palladium. Mm -hmm. Now, we saw palladium prices uh, rise, and there's been talk about parity. But that's a different animal in the precious metals space. So what do you make of all this hype surrounding palladium? Well, palladium and I'll, I'll say platinum and, and silver for that matter, they are technically precious metals. Uh, and the four of them together, platinum, palladium, silver, and gold, are called the noble metals. Mm -hmm. They, without getting too uh, scientific, they have they have unique characteristics in the periodic table of the elements that set them apart from things like uh, you know iron and copper and so forth. But be that as it may, of uh, those four, the only one that's pure money is gold. The problem with platinum, palladium, and silver, they have a lot of industrial applications. Mm -hmm. So if you're analyzing them, is there a precious metal aspect to it? Yes, especially with silver but they're also used in automobiles and aircraft manufacturing, as I say, a lot of industrial applications. Um, and so they could go down, not because uh, of inflation, not because um, precious metals are going down, but because we're in a recession or, you know, car manufacturing is in a slump, you know, et cetera. So it's, it's not a pure play, um, but uh, look, there's nothing, uh, it's a free market. There's nothing stopping anyone yeah, everyone favors diversification. Well, you could buy all four. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have some allocation and, you know, not necessarily one quarter each, but you could come up with an allocation and own all four metals. And then that would give you, you know, there are times when gold's slumping and maybe palladium's skyrocketing and then palladium cools off and gold goes up. So you get the benefit of that. Mm -hmm. And as we look ahead to uh, next year, you'll be speaking at the Sprott Natural Resources yes, Symposium in it. Vancouver, Canada. Right. And uh, we missed you this year. So between now and the conference, what do you expect to see? Can you make any predictions or what well, will you be talking about? Yeah, well, we'll know more about what the Fed's up to and, and the economy. I mean, the, the economy is slowing. Mm -hmm. whether, whether there's a technical recession or not, you know, remains to be seen, but it is absolutely slowing. And people go, wait a second, we just had, you know, 4.2% growth in the second quarter, and I think it was 3.5% or thereabouts uh, in the third quarter. And this is what Trump promised, you know, we're getting back to trend growth. The problem is the fourth quarter forecasts are barely hanging on to three, may very well come in below that. And so what you actually have is a downtrend, you know, from 4.2 to 3.5 or 6, and then maybe 3 or 2.9. Mm -hmm. And it looks like you're trending back to the same 2.2% growth that we've had for the last nine years. Obama, during the Obama administration, there were two times when they had back-to-back -back quarters 
of uh, you know, four percent or higher, or very, very close, high threes, four a couple times, uh, over four twice. And everyone's like, hey, happy days are here again. And both times it fell off a cliff, and once it went negative, and once it went down to 1% within a few quarters. Mm -hmm. So we've seen this movie before. I think we got a little Trump bump, or whatever you want to call it, with the uh, tax cut and uh, you know, in the second quarter. You look at the third quarter, by the way, a lot of that growth is um, inventories, inventory accumulation, final sales. We're only about half of what inventories were. So you, uh, inventory accumulation is fine if the economy is booming and you sell all that stuff. But if you're buying it, in anticipate what they're doing, they're buying it in anticipation of tariffs. They're trying to beat the tariffs. Mm -hmm. So what happens when the tariffs come in? They're not going to buy any more, and that's going to fall off a cliff. So um, uh, I think growth will be much weaker. It's, it's weaker in, in China. Um, Japan had a negative quarter. Germany had a negative quarter. France is probably going to have a negative quarter this quarter. There's a lot of kind of bad growth news coming in from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see what happens between uh, now and the conference. But before I let you go, I do want to ask you about uh, other threats. Since you are a chief global strategist at Meriglim, I do want to get your take on cybersecurity. Now, we understand there are plenty of risks out there, financial risks, mm -hmm. risks to consumers. So how are you factoring in potential cybersecurity threats um, when it comes to your overall strategy? Well, it's interesting because uh, the threats are the ones you mentioned. Uh, you know, the Chinese Navy is not going to sink the Seventh Fleet. and. You know, the Russian army is not going to go head to head with NATO in, uh, in Eastern Europe. But if the U.S. is vulnerable, it is exactly the kinds of things you, you mentioned, Mary, which are uh, cyber threats, infrastructure threats. And they go together because if you can get, if you can use cyber warfare to get inside the operating system of a hydroelectric plant mm -hmm. and open the floodgates and flood downstream and kill who knows how many thousands of people, th those are the things that uh, experts are most worried about. My, I'm familiar with that area, but my specialty obviously is finance. So I work with others and we look at penetration of the financial system. Uh, it's funny you mention it because I was just talking to some folks the other day planning another war game and this will be a digital cyber sure. financial war game. Uh, but I, they said, well, we're, you know, we're bringing in the top technology people and we want to confront their top, top technology people, et cetera. I mean, the, way, the worst thing you could do, for example, or we could experience, you get inside the order entry system at a major bank, Goldman, Morgan Stanley, City. I'm not picking on any bank, they're all vulnerable. You get inside the order entry system and you just start, you know, sell Apple, sell Google, sell Facebook, sell all, all these sell orders, but they look like they're coming from, let's say, Goldman or Morgan Stanley. You don't know it's uh, a cyber attack because you're actually inside mm. the bank's system. Sure. And you wouldn't, uh, what you would do is use what the military calls a force multiplier. What that means is you would start an attack like that on a day when the market's already down 800 points or the Dow Jones is down 800 points, then flood the market with sellers, try to drive it down two or 3,000 points, shut the market, um, you know, does it open the next day? I mean, that's a much more uh, serious attack. But one of the things I said to this uh, one expert, I said, why are you escalating the technology war? Why don't New York Stock Exchange should uh, rent a warehouse in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. install you know, copper landlines, um, have some old-fashioned trading posts, give everybody you know, cards and a Sharpie, and uh, take the orders by phone and, and just make a market the way they used to, not that long ago, and like, cut out all the high-frequency trade. I wouldn't spend a nickel of government money to keep high-frequency trading going. Who cares? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know this exchange likes it because they get fees. Hedge funds like it because they make money. I understand why people do it, but it, it doesn't really serve. It doesn't add liquidity. The people say it does, but it doesn't really. Um, and uh, so it's just computers front-running computers. Mm -hmm. But what does it do for the U.S. economy? The answer is nothing. But the retail investor, institutions, pension managers, they actually do want to buy or sell. And you could, if there's 6,000 tickers on New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ say, look, 5,000 of you, you got to wait, you know, we'll trade you once a week. But for, you know, the S&P 500, the big names, uh, we're going to trade them by phone and hand. And at least you can get a bid or an offer. And that you can't hack. And I would actually invite the Chinese to say, hey, have a look. If you hack us, this is where we're going. You can't stop this, so why don't you just give it up? It has a deterrent effect. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim, it's 
Very interesting. We're talking about this right now. I think many in the viewing audience, they're concerned about their privacy. And in the U.S., we're all connected by social security numbers. Most of us use uh, technology in the form of smartphones. And so there are so many risks out there. So just for the general viewer, what are your tips when it comes to staying safe? Well, we just had a long discussion, two questions about uh, how we're relying on you know, social media, digital media, sure. digital trading systems, so go non-digital. So what's, what are the best forms of wealth storage, investment, and wealth preservation that are not digital? Well, gold, we talked about, land, natural resources like water, mm -hmm. you know, silver and others. If you have, uh, I, and not 100% of everything, you know, people sure. always want to put words in your mouth. I always say, Joe Maker says, sell everything and buy gold. Never said that. <laughs> I do recommend a 10% allocation to gold. You can season to taste, make it five or whatever. But my point being, um, if you own physical gold in safe non-bank storage, you can't hack it. Mm -hmm. uh, government can shut the banks. You don't care. I mean, you, there's your gold. Uh, same thing with land. And, and the other items I mentioned. So I would have um, some of my portfolio in non-digital assets that if the whole system shut down, you'd say, well, I still own the land, I still own the gold, I still own the silver, it's all good. Mm -hmm. So long story short, diversification and stay away from digital wallets. Uh, oh, absolutely. You know, if you want to, again, if you want to put a little slice in Bitcoin, I wouldn't, but mm -hmm. if you do, just don't go all in on any of these things. Okay, Jim, well, thank you so much for Thanks joining for me ahead of the holidays, and I wish you a happy new year. Thank, thank you. you.